So Maria, what do you think of the Cyborg Tinkerer? Thanks, I hate it. Will, what do you think about the Cyborg Tinkerer? I like it better than Children with Blood and Bone. Oh <laughs> my god! Why would you verbalize like that? Like, that is getting in your soul and never tell anyone. Hello, 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 hello! It's unresolved textual tension today. We're going to be talking about a book called Cyborg Tinkerer. My name is Katie, and here are my co-hosts. William. This was a book that was much requested by you guys, so this pain and suffering we went through... is your fault! Reading this book was as if I had put the ghost chili pepper on my tongue, sniffed it like cocaine in my nose, rubbed it into my eyes, and stuck it up my bum. That's what reading this book felt like. I will say this is by far the most painful book that I've had to read for this podcast. Below even Ice Planet Barbarians, because Ice Planet Barbarians didn't take itself as seriously. I would say for me, it was even worse than... So The Savior Sister had a lot of like it it had a high concept that it just fumbled and that made it really not enjoyable and the characters were super dislikable but who oh boy this one was just a doozy i didn't like the writing and the narration i didn't like the plot i didn't like the characters i have a lot of issues with the character motivations and how they connect to everything else you mean how they don't <laughs> yes or, or how like characters will have a motivation forget about it for a, a long time and then all of a sudden be like yes i must get patronage i did not intensely viscerally hate this as much as maria and katie i want to stress for a moment i do not think it is a good book and it is a really poor book and it is amazing to me that these author tubers have massive platforms because Meglator, the author here, has a massive platform. I don't understand who they think they are to be giving writing advice. And we'll talk about that more as we go on. This is not a good book, but also I didn't I like I didn't hate it. Part of it is my brain started to categorize it as fan fiction really early on because the first half of the book really feels like an AU. And you're like, oh, this is just some teen writing in, uh, in you know, on fanfic.net because that's when I came of age. But no, this is an adult human with opposable thumbs and a YouTube channel where she gives writing advice. I could never hate something like this. However, I pity it. No, it needed, it It just needed. Oh, extermination, just full on flames. Guillotine. I, I just, I, I'm, I'm being dramatic. I didn't like this book at all. Again, it was my least, it was my least favorite book I've read this entire time. And we have read some doozies. The story I thought this was originally going to be, I think could have been an easier story to write, a tighter story to write, and a better read because one of the things I'm going to mention as we kind of go through is that this story has too much going on. This book has too many like things it's trying to be and accomplish. And it's like, at a certain point, it's like you're making a soup and you just started throwing things in that like shouldn't be there. And it's like, you take the first like sip and the first flavors that hit you, you're like, oh yeah, okay, maybe I could. And then all of a sudden there's like, cinnamon just smacking you in the face by notes of cinnamon did you mean within the first chapter there's someone finger banging the main character and did you mean that there's a very uncomfortable very uh dubious threesome scene in the last like <laughs> five seconds of the book i don't even mean anything that detailed and I, I argue that my seasonings metaphor is the one i i want because i'm not talking about any of that i'm talking about the fact that you have steampunk but you have treasure planet steampunk like uh, ships that have force fields around them but they're actual sailing ships you have a circus you have cyborgs and you have fairy tale retelling don't forget death competition and death competition that's too many things if we're talking like ways to handle a story you gotta slim it down you shouldn't have that many things i actually wrote it down someplace and i'm really frustrated i can't find it i might have accidentally not saved it but i looked up all of the genres for this. Hold on a second. A science fiction, steampunk, romance, adventure, LGBT, fairy tale, fairy tale retelling. 
story. And that's what I'm talking about when I say if she would have slimmed down and just picked, like if you wanted to do a Treasure Planet Cyborg Circus, that's one thing. But to add death competition and fairy tale retelling, like it's, you needed to pick a couple of these elements, commit to them and see them through. Because the problem, as I'll talk through, is that none of these elements get explored in a meaningful way. And some of it, like the steampunk element, is feels very forced on. Like people just have cogs for no reason. And instead of saying like a ship engineer, it's a tinkerer. Fairy tale part to me was even more perfunctory because it is so perfunctory. It's like, oh, he likes a rose. And then the other one is called Aurora. And then at the end, she changes her name to Aurora. Oh God. What are the promotional I promotional images on the- I know, that's what I was gonna, you need to put it in there. You need to put it in there. I will flash it across the screen so you can see her brilliant marketing is- It's so bad. What if Belle, main character, has nothing to do with Belle at, at all. all. Belle's in love with the Beast and Sleeping Beauty, but what if she doesn't have to choose? Everybody was wondering that. Like, you know, we didn't know for sure, and now we're glad we don't have to make the choice. <laughs> Yes, ages long issue we've all had thinking about these story tales. Aurora or the Beast? <laughs> All right, before we before we tear into this more, Maria, why don't you tell us what the premise of this book is? This book uh, is situated, in, like I said, Treasure Planet Steampunk World, and we have our main character, Gwendolyn Grimm, who is a ship's tinkerer. As she likes to tell us a million times, I'm no cyborg tinkerer. I'm no cyborg tinkerer. Damn it, Jim, I'm a ship tinkerer, not a cyborg tinkerer. <laughs> it never stops. Gwendolyn Grimm, she's a ship's tinkerer. She's coming at the end of a contract that she hasn't renewed because, surprise, Gwendolyn Grimm is a sad piece of toast. It came back. She's dying of brain cancer. And she doesn't like to let anyone forget. She's really fixated on this to the point that even though she describes herself as quite a sexual being, she can't get off. Sex is a no-go because she's dying because I guess terminally ill people can't enjoy what's left of their life but she literally says like she she physically cannot do sexy stuff right now because she's so preoccupied with the fact that she's dying and so the story starts with Gwendolyn being like how am I going to die like I guess I'm just gonna live on this planet I I can't get back to my home and my family it's too far of a journey I'd never make it but before we get any deeper into the book Katie who are our sponsors this week our sponsors are us it's Patreon. Thank you everyone who has so far joined our Patreon, all 14 of you. That is 14 more than I believe we would ever get. So thank you for inspiring me and making me hope again in human spirit. And if you want to join our Patreon, the link will be in the description below. We have a Discord where we just shoot the shit and talk with people. And we have a monthly book club where you get to decide the book that we'll read um, by polling and voting. And then at the end of the month, me, Maria, and Katie will do a live stream and you can come into the chat and ask us questions or give opinions and we'll interact with you guys which we think is pretty cool because a lot of you guys are uh, book nerds like us you guys are very nerdy very <laughs> very nerdy now back to the show how is Gwendolyn Grimm going to spend her first day on off ship on planet as she prepares to die Gwen you know she's moody and depressed and somebody's like wow Sir the bog's in town we should go to someone else not her because Gwen doesn't have friends right now she's like I guess you know I have nothing else going for me I might as well go see an illegal cyborg circus because you find out very briefly at this point that cyborgs are illegal within like the their little government system empire so Cirque du Borg should not be here why is the cyborg circus that knows it's illegal to be performing on this planet on this planet I I don't know dumb decisions she goes to the cyborg circus she's watching some like an acrobat and a tumbler and she's like wow that girl's kind of hot I I will leave that there um and then she, there's a, a lady who she ends up talking to and they go into an alley and the lady finger bangs her. Yes, very intensely. Maria, let me ask you a question. Hit me. When I said, hey Maria, do you want to start a book club and we'll do it as a podcast? Did you think we were going to have to talk about sex this much? No. 
it's amazing that we have to keep talking about it, but it keeps happening, and I don't know why. Part There's of it sex is in a lot of places. Yeah, but you don't think it's going to be something like I genuinely did not think it was going to be something like I thought we'd be talking about pacing, character development. Like I, I thought we'd be a little more highbrow. No, 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 no. We're going to talk about sex the whole time. These author two books, because now we've read three. We've read this one. We've read Savior's uh, Sister and Savior's Champion by Jenna Moresi, which go check those out, guys. They are so horny. This book especially is, oh my God, it has ruined sex for me forever. It is horror than Savior's Sister and I did not think that was possible. The first thing I told Maria when I read the first 20 pages is I called her and I said, wow, is this author like really horny? She's not getting um, laid? It's a middle school boy kind of horny where like the main character who is bi, right? Awesome representation, great, whatever, people, whatever. We'll talk about the diverse, the diversity stuff later. But she is constantly talking about other women's asses and boobs. Yes. And like, I'm gonna reveal something to you guys. I am a straight man. <gasps> no way! Will. Oh my god! Will, why didn't you ever open up to us and tell us? I didn't know. I'm also cis, so I was being <gasps> afraid of being judged. Your life is so hard. Thank you. It's good that I'm in a safe place here. I enjoy the female physique in a crass way. Maria knows far too much about my interest in specifically uh the decollage of women decolletage but yes decolletage she <laughs> it is endlessly annoying to her <laughs> and inexplicable i think the way i described it is that there is an inherent power in the shape of them like a celtic rune where just the shape of it is or it's we're like the golden too much. Ring. we're spending my, my point is, this should, book should appeal to me. It does not. It is so juvenile that I am now off. I'm not into those stuff anymore. It is so juvenile and middle grade, the way she describes everything. It genuinely feels like an alien was like, oh, okay, this is how humans discuss sexuality. For another perspective, I have dabbled in the arts of sapphic love vagine i would say katie is a pansexual and so what little could entice me did not i'm i'm gonna go so far as to say this book this book really grossed me out yes actually yeah it does and the thing is it is constant we're not even going to talk about it at every point but it is constantly like oh she was hot or oh his dick twitched which uh, we're gonna talk i don't like that description ever okay? <laughs> i know as someone with the correct equipment, that is not how I would characterize it, but we'll- I mean, listen, there are times where it doth indeed. It doth. Maria, how would you know? How would she know? Oh my God. Do you have firsthand experience in this? Yeah, she has her own dick. Okay. And, and like, guys, we really are a very sex positive group. Like we really don't, but this is, it's just- That's an it's understatement. So, <laughs> it's so annoying in this book. And it starts here with the finger blasting. It actually started before where there was a hot girl who was when Gwendolyn Grimm was leaving the ship was like, why haven't we banged in a while? Because people just casually bang on this ship and she's like, oh, I'm dying from brain cancer. Remember, she's also this person in particular is supposed to be a prostitute. And she goes around and she has fun with a whole bunch of people and Gwendolyn's one of them. And she's like, oh, Gwen, you're like one of my favorites. Don't you want to like go have a good time? And Gwen's like, I'm dying. <laughs> Who can have sex while dying? <laughs> but anyway, in the middle of getting finger banged, uh, Gwen is like, ah, I'm not in it. This makes me uncomfortable. I don't feel good. I can feel, she literally describes it like she can feel the tumor pressing on her. And then the, the police come because this is a an illegal cyborg performance and it's a circus. So it's fucking noticeable <laughs> and the police come and Gwen is like I gotta skedaddle and get on my little skimmer thing and get out of here but oh no I'm having a tumor headache the same type of scene from Treasure Planet the skimmer is suspiciously a lot like whatever the heck they this gym rides in that is less steampunk than it is trying to be the world from Treasure Planet. So it's very weird that she tried shoehorning because like I would have just been like, I was inspired by Treasure Planet and left it at that. Again, too many layers, especially because like electricity is a thing and like computers and computer programming is a thing. And that's not very steampunk. No, but also, hey, okay, 
There is a specific part in this book where it is explicitly stated that you cannot send me messages digitally because it is too expensive. Instead, you have to have a letter carrier and they have to physically go to that place across the fucking universe. And it's like, I'm sorry, in this future world, you're telling me that we have crossed distances between planets and we can't send a message digitally? Here's the thing. I'm going to make a comparison here that will please Maria because it is about her second favorite book. No, not Spinning Silver. No. But one of the things I noted about Hyperion while we were reading it is that it has a lot of kind of pulpy. Oh, no, I'd say Hyperion might be my favorite. Oh, OK. A woman of taste and class um, and also less step ons. Uh, so <laughs> what does that even mean? Step on. Remember, Remember step the on? younger brother that no, neither I, I thought know. I felt... I'm well aware, but what is that? Dude, we didn't hate him that much, did we? I... Go back. You, you both him. disliked him very much. I've watched that video oh, really? several times. Anyway, continuing. Anyway. Less step on. <laughs> continuing. One of the things I like about the universe is how pulpy it feels. So it is entirely possible to write a pulpy universe, but also have some kind of logical sense to it. And also to play into the sci fi ness of it. So, like in that world, there's like trapped singularities, which is a ridiculous ridiculous thing but it sounds cool and there's like flatliners who and you can move through things i'm saying this because i know somebody's gonna make the defense of like it's not supposed to be serious okay there's not serious and then there are things in the world that don't even really make sense and as maria said the cyborg part of this is very perfunctory and that annoyed me because i really like cyborg stories and especially like the ways that can change humanity and that does not happen here it really doesn't it the story likes to think that it is grappling with that issue but the cyborgness is very like will said perfunctory it literally is just like ah now you have a metal arm or like there's nothing in a way that it changes the way you process changes the way you think it literally just becomes an addition to your body that other people treat you like shit for and not only that but nobody is ever nobody ever mentions the concept of like a ghost limb or like like the missing of their human self or battling. Like a lot of people have problems with their cyborg things, hence cyborg tinkerer. Nobody has like a third arm, for example. There's no transhumanism to it. There's a trans woman in this. There's no mention that like cybernetics is one of the only ways she can feel truly herself and change her body. There's no grappling with that trans biological thing that cyborgs can do or even the modularity of it. Me and Maria read in the class that we first met where we hated all of the other writers, or at least I did and Maria put up with my hating of them. There's a, a piece of writing, an essay called The Cyborg Manifesto, which is not actually about cyborgs. It's about how our identity can be malleable and shaped and changed and stuff like that. But I feel like cyborg implants is a way to externalize that into the story. And this book does not do that at all. Instead, she pantomimes it with this weird concept that they have uh, erasing memories once they get an implant. So for example, there are some cyborgs that only get their arms replaced, but yet they're forgetting their original human memories. And honestly, you could remove that, like the forgetting of the past entirely from the book. And honestly, the plot wouldn't change. No, it wouldn't. So uh, Gwen passes out. She gets put in prison and she was like, I guess I'm gonna die here because I'm gonna be in here for a while because I have no one to bail me out. And then a rich looking gentleman comes in and is like, I would like to speak to her. And he's like, hello, my name is Bastion Kabir. No, you have to put the full voice on. This is my Bastion Kabir voice. If you have a problem Fine. with it, find a new narrator. Hello, my name is Bastion Kabir. I work for the- Cirque de Borg. And we would like you to be our cyborg tinkerer. And if you do this, we will get rid of your brain tumor and you shall live, but then you shall be one of us. And you'll have a contract for 13 years. And at the 13 years, your contract will be up. And yes, it's a long time. And like, and she's like very quickly is like, death? cyborg life yes and she's like what will i have to do and this is again as katie said something that she will continue to say for the rest of the book i'm not a cyborg tinkerer i'm a ship tinkerer i have no knowledge a physician and an engineer like there just so happens to be physician engineers just lying around my uncle is a mechanic he works on cars. Obviously, tomorrow he could go in and start working on prosthetic limbs. Yep. The yeah. two areas of study are completely interchangeable. I also want to state that the whole idea of the 13 years of contract in replacement for limbs, 
that is a fascinating idea in terms of like capitalism, in terms of like you are actually parts of you are owned by someone yes. else. Lots of people have done interesting things like this. Like let's say they gave them a hearing aid, but then part of that was that it was leased and you always had to listen to commercials or something like that. There's a lot of really fascinating ways that technology intruding on us can be companies or other people intruding on us that is not explored here it's just basically like you have 13 years and sometimes we get to do a cosplay of repo the genetic opera <laughs> whatever that thing is called yes. yeah it's you're right it's, if you if you know anything about repo the genetic opera it's coming for you guys um but anyway so she's like yes i'll do it i will join your circus bastion kabir one of the rules and you start learning about this now is Cyborgs are kind of illegal, so they can't have any real jobs. Uh, and if they're within the normal world, you get really shitty jobs and you're not treated well. But it is illegal to create new cyborgs. So like, even extra illegal. I also want to point out that at this point, Gwen is having a really hard time deciding, oh, do I want to die or do I want to do this? Which makes you think, oh, becoming a cyborg is really bad, probably because it's illegal, probably because of the indentured servitude. But she's having this really difficult time and she's like, I really don't want to be a cyborg. Cyborgs aren't really that great. They're reviled. And then later, as we'll mention, she changes and she's like, the cyborgs are my family. We'll talk about the informed Nakama found family thing that happens later. I want to bring up two <laughs> points. It's so stupid. It doesn't, it's like, she's just like, these are my family now. It will also connect to my point that characters have very simplistic motivations like Meglator when she was plotting this out, originally wrote down what her character motivations were. Then the story took a life of its own, but she kept trying to shoehorn the character motivations in because for literally none of them do you feel these character motivations genuinely. But we'll get there. Two issues. First, uh, what Kitty was talking about is one of the big writing problems with this book is the first three chapters are almost entirely Gwen thinking things in her head. There's mm -hmm. there's like, there's some interaction, but it's a lot of her just, and this is an issue writers often have is they don't externalize character motivations or um, thoughts. So it's a lot of her thinking a thing and then walking around and it, it gives you sort of a weird disconnected feeling to the world. No, this is not supposed to mirror her having a tumor and think she's thinking she's gonna die. This is just a rad writing. Secondly, the idea of only old implants working is really kind of fascinating. Companies often just discontinue old products or they have planned obsolescence, which is where they just plan for it to stop working over time. Or like, you know, maybe you have a USB 2 limb, but all of a sudden there's USB 3 and companies don't really give a shit about you being able to have this thing. Uh, not explored in this. I just think it, like it's such a missed opportunity. But again, this is a pantomime of the, and each of the genres she attempts to tackle in this. It's not a true delve into any of the concepts or the themes of any of them. Instead, it's just a, a menagerie of pretending. Because it's illegal to make a new cyborg on any of the planets, it is not illegal to do so in the space between. So uh, she gets to meet Celeste, who is the owner and proprietor of Cirque de Borg. And Celeste is the actual like cyborg tinkerer, like on, like she's, she knows what she's doing. She turns Gwen into a cyborg. She gets rid of the tumor. They give her a cyborg eye that's like now in her head. And they also implant a chip into her head that makes it so her brain and the cyborg part will communicate properly. And it's that chip that apparently will make you lose your memories. Oh, also because of the chip, they have to do this without anesthesia and you have to be like, Awake. It would have been so much fun if we could have gotten Gwen going through the torture of that and then the ramifications of that following afterwards. This book does not shy away from some really gross shit like violent stuff later. So I don't know why we didn't get that. Like, it's not like she was like, oh, that's too much for an action adventure treasure planet. The other thing is I often talk about like if you've watched our other reviews, if not, welcome. I've often talked about when certain things happen, there needs to be some sort of blowback or mental like reckoning with it and and so in the past it's been like you murdered someone for the first time how are you handling that or like you murder someone who was innocent outside of like misunderstanding a situation that should have some mental blowback unless you've particular you've specifically designed your character to be a sociopath and they, none of that actually affects them in which case good job you're doing it right but if your character is not supposed to be a sociopath there should be some like, and I'm not saying it has to be blowback, but some mental reckoning where they sit down and they grapple with that. Similarly, if you have been your whole life 
told cyborgs are terrible, they're bad, they're they're not. And, and not that Gwen ever feels like she herself thought badly of cyborgs, but definitely that she didn't want to be one because it's a of stigma. the situation. There is a stigma. You never get a moment of Gwen, like you don't get the moment of Gwen waking up as a cyborg. The next time you see Gwen is from another character's point of view who sees her, who literally looks at her and goes, oh my God, she's so hot. This is the most turned on I've been in years. Instantly, she felt wetness between her legs. Katie is not paraphrasing. That happens. Never have I just looked at someone and been like, pow. Now, sometimes (laughs) I look at my boyfriend. Hi, Logan. Not that you ever watch any of our videos, it's fine. (laughs) In those moments, but there's like, there's built up. It genuinely feels like this was written by a middle school boy who was like, I I pop a boner, women must do that too. Yes, no, 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 listen to this. When she first meets Gwen, Rora thinks to herself that she can't speak and it's as if she swallowed some nut butter. Nut butter. She literally says Meg nut butter. As in- her metaphorical descriptions, again, her heart was heavy as a, a large woman's breasts, tits. Like, And then it was as if she swallowed nut butter. It's like you gave an AI or an alien <laughs> some description. Vague, vague descriptions of everything in the world. And they were like, all right, we're matching these two things because they have synonymous meanings in certain ways. Yeah, that's hilarious. That's so, And that's a lot of the writing. So as soon as I read that, it completely, of course, ruined, just like many of these things happen in this book, ruined the scene for me. I was like, nut butter? As in like, Meg Latour is so horny that she's thinking about <laughs> nut butter? That's what I, I wrote. It's an I, unconscious <laughs> Freudian slip. Yes. Look, this is what I wrote. Will it show? There. What the heck? How was a physical? Oh, wait, no. I get no. why there is. She's... <laughs> Okay, jizz, right. jizz, jizz, jizz. <laughs> so, okay, where were we? Yes, Rora, whose viewpoint this is from, is one of the love interests. She is the super hot acrobat that Gwen saw earlier. She is also much shorter than than Gwen. And if, in case you forget, the author likes to remind you by when they embrace, Gwen often thinks, and then her bountiful breasts pressed yes. into my abdomen. And I was like- Yes, her taut nipples pressed into her uh, her stomach. So if you have trouble remembering- you're welcome. I made this comment about Ice Planet Barbarians where I legitimately thought that sometimes the author forgot that she said stuff before um, and then she says it again and it feels repetitive to you. I don't think that's what happened with Megalator. I think Megalator thought this was like description. You need to remind the author. And and again, this is her first book. Like, so here's Maria's regular disclaimer. If you liked this book, I'm very happy for you. I'm not here to take your joy over it. I just I didn't like it. I don't think it's a great book. If you heard any of these descriptions that we've given you so far and you thought, ah, yes, fine, fine, innovative, writing, evocative, evocative, yeah. then like, I'm so happy you'll enjoy this. Yeah, book. no, that's, that is fine. <laughs> no, but you have to ask yourself for those who have listened to our other episode about children of blood and bone, despite Will's own opinions on it, seeing that compared to this is as if, you were looking at my painting from when I was four years old and a Picasso. And that's how intense it is just from that, even though Children of Blood and Bone has its own issues. As similar to uh, Will's description of the savior sister versus Hyperion, it's it's yes. like, a, like a lizard and then an elephant. And yeah. you're like, these are the same. <laughs> and you're like, no, they do not belong in even the same vague mode of artistry. Uh, author 2 bothers me so much. We'll talk about it in a little bit, though. But let's hit. Let's keep going with the story because we're about five minutes in. Right, no, Rora is the second main character. She's an acrobat. She is also really horny for Gwen all the time. She's Gwen across the crowded room. But the two of them, like, they make eyes, but they don't really talk yet. Very quickly, we go from this uh, to... Uh, a to Rora being like, my life's goal is to perform for the emperor and get patronage and I need a new hand and I am going to seduce that really hot cyborg tinkerer that I'm already into. So like, there's a problem uh, where Rora is described to us often as a selfish, calculating and manipulative character in the pursuit of getting what she wants. But Rora also genuinely is into Gwen. So setting up, I'm going to seduce her just to use her for my set, my hand. 
And then also having her genuinely be into Gwen from the very beginning does not work because all of their interactions where she's seducing Gwen are her actually trying to create a relationship with Gwen. It's like she never read a romance where it's like, okay, this started out as I'm dating her to win a bit with my friends. But then I, over time, I began to like the girl or whatever that trope is. No, just from the beginning, she's a... Sploosh. It's really frustrating. It's, it's because also that means the character remains stagnant throughout the whole story because the whole time she's doing the same thing. So Rora's like, I shall seduce her and immediately goes to Gwen and is like, hi, I'm having trouble with my hand. Will, will you help me? Also, there's a ball tonight. Do you want to go? And Gwen was like, nah, I wasn't going to go. Like, that's not really my scene. I'm a tool kill toolkit around the belt kind of girl. I'm not a dress kind of girl. I, and I don't also have any dresses. And Rora's like, I can give you dresses. And Gwen immediately is like, damn, this bitch hot. I'm into this. They have a montage of getting ready. They put Gwen in this gold giant ball gown. I, I... But she keeps her boots because if she was one of the characters in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, she wouldn't be the Sundance Kid. During their getting ready process, they talk and learn about each other. She learns that Rora came from a noble family and that this noble family had their daughter become an acrobat and uh, not like a ballerina. <laughs> or it's just, it's weird. It's a weird like pick to go to and that their goal for her was to get patronage and to just be like uh, an acrobat acrobat in the lap of luxury but then she broke her arm and then eventually she became a cyborg there's a missing piece there that we're gonna get later that makes no sense no agreed fully heavily totally intensely and then you learn uh that gwen came from like this really religious planet that isn't too hot on the emperor and like they her family purposefully was against who the current emperor is and so like they were stripped of their land and titles neither of these characters feel like they come from like wealthy or like even semi well-to-do backgrounds but anyway so they go to the ball and at the ball like they're dancing gwen can't dance because of course why would she be able to dance oh no 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 i'm sorry maria you scared the thing that the author is most proud of in this entire book, clearly, which is when Gwen has to be announced to go in. And the oh, guy yeah. is like, what name would you like to be announced by? And she's like, I'm, I'm Gwendolyn Grimm. And he's like, but what's title? And she goes, I'm fucking Gwendolyn No, Grimm. I'm Gwendolyn fucking, fucking Grimm. Grimm. And that is then a joke throughout the rest of the book because the author seems to think it's really witty or funny or indicative it's supposed to be sassy and as we've already discussed at length in many videos we love our sassy indignant characters help me <laughs> <laughs> so they they go to the ball she's dancing and then bastion cuts in and is like miss rora's last name may i cut in because he always talks like a posh man and they're dancing and he was like things are going to get dangerous you should be careful and maybe leave right now and she's like what the fuck are you talking about bastion like i don't know you i don't know where you came from get the fuck out of my face and he's like i'm trying to help you why is he trying to help her then towards the end of the ball i would say the middle of the evening they say right at around like maybe 11 o'clock at night um the celeste the celine celeste i don't know the celeste the head of the um cirque de board comes the mistress. the mistress the mistress she's like hello everyone welcome so we got great news the emperor who hates us made us illegal 15 years ago and got rid of all the new cyborg parts and everything has decided he wants us to perform for him and maybe it'll change his mind Yay! That's Yay. such a great plan. How logical. We have so much historical information to back up that assumption. It is not a trap, clearly. It would never be a trap. Why would it be a trap? And also, the historical background about this has been given to you like maybe five pages beforehand from Gwen info dumping in like a couple paragraphs history. But anyway, and then she's like, but unfortunately, only 10 acts can perform for him and we haven't been making a lot of money yesterday. So 40 of you, because there's 50 acts, have got to go. So we're having a competition congratulations all those who don't win the rounds will have their contracts terminated and everybody gasps and go on it's like have their contracts terminated that seems fine what could possibly be so bad about that and i'm like <sighs> death competition it's a fucking i read the savior's champion now we have another death competition great anyway and she's like also the first 
uh, task competition is right now. Yay. Well, okay. So what happens is the problem with their contract being breached or discontinued is that their cyborg parts have to come off. We don't learn that now, though. Gwen learns about it afterwards. This feels about as natural as the scene in Children of Blood and Bone where they had the warring ships in water in the middle of a desert in a coliseum. So it feels like you stepping on a tack. That's what these scenes feel like. And there's no sense of, because generally if you're going to upset the status quo that bad, there needs to be some sense of what the status quo was. Like if there had been, and here's the thing, I think the death competition is a terrible idea. I, I would have liked if, how the cyborg circus, and this is where I thought it was going, and I thought would have been a much simpler story to tell, because it again, you remove su- a couple of layers. I thought it would have been much more interesting if the way the cyborg circus mainly supported itself was by also using their circus acts to be pirates. And like, she was going- That's what I thought too! And she was going to have to learn how to like actually be a cyborg tinkerer and a ship's tinkerer and learn how to like maybe defend herself and like hijinks ensue. I thought that would have been a simple, straightforward story. We would have needed a conflict at some point, but pirates and your illegal cyborg pirates. So like that would have been really cool. And that Celeste would have been like- cyborg captain of the pie and like i don't know that that it was that would have been so much better that's what i thought this movie or this movie shame that's what i thought this book was it's because on the front cover you have that ship going you don't expect to have uh, a planet which they go to immediately after she like she she wakes up there on like they're they're on this planet yeah all of this stuff with the cyborgs is on the planet that the cyborgs live on and dragons don't forget we'll get yeah there. yes we'll get there maria makes a really great point this all makes sense and also with will's concept of what is it to be human this would be a very easy concept to address when you're in the middle of space, when you have half your humanity ripped away, and we're so far into the future, we don't know what's the norm. So this would have been a perfect sci-fi setting to explain that. But instead, I'm sorry, Meg, you f- you fucked it. Death competition. And because it, it just- uh, Too many layers. Too many it's- layers. <laughs> it's an onion. It's an onion. And it's not a nice onion. It's one of those onions that you immediately cut and it makes you cry. And then when you eat it, you're like, why is this onion biting me? As I bite it. Um, (laughs) So death competition. And it's right now. And then you see people like taking off their clothes because everyone's in fucking ball gowns. And the way the the basic rules is that if you have an act with multiple people, one person has to like compete in all the competitions. You can't have the whole act to do it. But if that one person loses in that round, the entire act gets sacked. Rora is a solo artist. And so she has no team members. So she has to do everything herself. She has her friends, Marzana and Akio. And I don't know, there's a couple other people. And Marzana and Akio are in an act together. And Akio decides to do the competition this round. And what it is, is like a death obstacle course. And Rora immediately makes the assumption that Gwen knew about this death competition and that's why she didn't want to go, which is a really weird assumption to make. It is. Given that very quickly Gwen is convinced to go. And I feel like if I knew there was a death competition and I wanted to avoid it, I would just have been like, no, I'm tired. I just got turned into a fucking cyborg. Leave me alone, Rora. And if this felt contrived to you listening to it, it's so much worse in the book somehow. It just feels so con- like such a contrived, like, oh no, now we need some dissension between the two, some conflict. Also, why would she care? Why would she feel betrayed? She does not know Gwen. She's gonna try to steal stuff from, or like get her- You're right, Katie. That's in- entirely it. If your plan is to seduce her and get her to give you a good arm, you should not fucking care and you should not act differently towards her and you will see Rora completely forgets her motivation and acts completely differently towards her. Afterwards she's very pissed at Gwen and she pushes her away but if she's if she's trying to seduce her and get some type of service out of her by lying to her and swindling her why in the why? Why would you do that? So competition, it's a death obstacle course. Um, there's this dude named Adrican. Adrican? Adrican. Who has an Irish accent. Scottish. Scottish. And also, to be clear, this is how we know he's bad. He's also the only person in the entire setting to be homophobic. Yeah. I know. He says, doink. 
a whole bunch. Anyway. He's the only one like this in the entire setting. Abraham doesn't like Rora, is going to try fuck with her. Uh, Rora gets through the obstacle course. She makes it through. A lot of people die during the uh, obstacle course, but she ends up coming through. And then they're like, okay, the rest of you get taken to have your contracts ended. And then you switch to Gwen's point of view where they're like, you now need to remove all the cyborg parks that parts that are our property from these cyborgs and she's like oh absolutely not i can't do that number one i don't know i've never operated on a human before this isn't just like and what if they need their implant to survive oh we should uh make sure to quote uh megalator's favorite quote you did it very well well before do you remember her heart sagged like an old woman's tits no not that the whole I'm a ship's tinkerer. Ah, uh, <laughs> God a damn it, Jim. Tinkerer. I'm a ship's tinkerer, not a cyborg tinkerer. She says that every chapter. She's like, I, I can't do this. And then Celeste's like, I won't give you a choice. And then like one of the guards like beats her with something. And they're like, if you don't do, I don't need you to have legs. So like, if you don't listen, I will literally. What was the point of hiring her? Break your legs. And uh, Bastion will help you. And she's like, I need alcohol. I need like boiling water it, it's like birth in like you like you get the blank the towels and the boiling water i thought the same thing i was like oh at least she knows that much and then she um like she has to remove all of these cyborg parts and luckily everyone that she like removes none of them were people who had parts that were necessary for their overall survival and everyone survived that night and it, literally the next morning she's literally just covered in blood her and bastion sat through this whole thing together she's super pissed at Bastion because she was like you knew this and you did warn me but you should have warned me more clearly (laughs) why did you hire me and he was like well to be frank I didn't know about this death competition when I hired you we really just needed a cyborg tinkerer and you're the best ship tinkerer and I thought you'd be a quick study I wasn't aware and then she realizes Rora is pissed at her and there's like an undisclosed amount of time in between each of the competitions but in book time like like you reading it feels like very short because what happens in this in-between period is she convinces Rora, she realizes Rora's mad at her. She convinces Rora to not be mad at her. The two flirt, then her and Bastion get friendly. And she also fixes Marzana's foot. Marzana has a cyborg foot and she thinks she's fixed it. And she's talking to Bastion and she's like, you know, you could have prepared for me this better. Uh, and they're arguing about something because her and Bastion don't get along. And then she's like, I need better books. And he's like, actually, I might be able to help with that. And thus, they have to go into Bastion's room. And instead of telling her as they're walking to his room, like, hey, we need to convince the guards that we're going in my room for private time. So I'm going to kiss you. uh, He just kisses her out of nowhere. And she's also like, damn, do I kind of like this? Um, even though I'm totally into Aurora right now. And then they go in his room. At Once they're in his bedroom, he was like, sorry, I just needed the, like, I'm going to show you something that I shouldn't. So I need the guards not to question that we're like in my bedroom. So we need to make it believable. So then instead of just getting on the bed and start going, <laughs> they actually kiss and get heavy. I know, why don't I, also, why not just do, um, mm, um, 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 Bastion. Uh, Bastion. Like, what are you doing? Why are you actually kissing? This makes no sense. And she also is like, I guess we have to do this now. And so they kiss again. Um, and then they like shimmy down a window, like and down a drain, and then they Wait, go. Wait, you forget. You forget the best part. What? He tented his trousers. Oh yeah, Bastion got turned on. I don't care. Continuing, and this is one of my least favorite scenes because this is one of the first times. Because you you realize she, I didn't realize when I first started this that she's trying to shoehorn a fairy tale thing into it. Maria, let me ask you something. Yeah. Of all fairy tales, which is your favorite? Beauty and the Beast. Interesting. So was this book therefore your favorite because there are random Beauty and the Beast references? No, thanks. I hate it. (laughs) So Bastion leads her along and shows her that there's this door that he has keys to. He only recently got the keys because now he's part of upper management. Yes. And this has been a dream of his for quite some time. And he takes this key. They go down this staircase forever and ever and ever. And then they get to this door and Meg Latour had the gall. <laughs> the absolute audacity. To have Gwen say, I'm not going to, what do you expect me to close my eyes or something? I'm not going to close my eyes. And it's like, you don't have to be that on the nose on because that's exactly what bell says or what what the beast has bell do and so anyway they open the door and the lights come on 
it's a library. Who knew? Beautiful. This makes total sense. Giant library that she wasn't allowed access to. And it's beautiful. And she's like, wow, this is amazing. And I'm like, oh. I've never seen so many books in one place. It really angered me because not only is this not even an actual fairy tale attempt. <laughs> it's just copying a scene from a Disney film. It's just, it's a weird choice. Anyway, while they're in there, she does find some actual books about cyborg tinkering. And she realizes that in Marzana's foot, she accidentally crossed two wires that shouldn't have been like, like they're and it, her foot will malfunction. And she's like, man, I've got to fix this before the next competition. And Bastion's like, Ooh, actually that starts at dawn. And they're like, what time is it? And it's like 6am. So like the sun is coming up. This is when a concept is introduced that Bastion may or may not have an eating disorder. And I felt this was about as comfortably ingratiated into the story as me shoving my fist up someone's ass. As someone who has struggled with these things, the way she handled it was so unnatural. Instead of, instead of, so Gwen's sitting with Bastion and they're eating while they're in this library before they go off to go rescue and do things. And she thinks to herself, oh, he is not eating very much. He's playing with the food on his plate. And not that maybe he just doesn't have an appetite or that, you know, he just doesn't eat very well. She specifically says, I wonder if he's restricting. And I'm just like, that is not what people think right off the bat. That is a very specific thing to jump to. She's literally like, I've never seen him eat before. I work with this girl, Danielle. Hi, Danielle. And <laughs> I have never actually seen Danielle ingest food. It's because she freaking doesn't when she's working. But sometimes she does. Like, she'll have the yogurt next to her, but I've never actually caught her eating the eating food. It. Now, recently I saw her eating chocolate, but, like, not once did it occur to me to go, ah, oh, mayhaps. There's also the fact that it's such a specific jargon of, like, oh, That's what I I'm know what they write. I know what the, yes. the term is. Why would Gwen, a ship's tinkerer, why would she say, oh, I have so much experience with this, with knowing so many people that do this? And it's like, this just doesn't feel comfortable. You can incorporate that. That's fine. We can do representation. That's fine. But this feels so uncomfortable. And it's even highlighted more so because she calls Bastion out on it. And it's so weird. Okay, so this is a problem with author tube as a whole and it was also a bit of a problem in the Savior series. They are woke, right? So they have to have diversity. Now, do you incorporate incorporate this diversity into the characters and world? No. You have a cast of a lot of people of a lot of different like races and maybe genders and oh, a man with an eating disorder. See, it's representation. Two problems with this. First of all, this is not a thing that you can just have going on in the world. Marzana is a trans woman. It's mentioned at the beginning, not mentioned again. That is okay because this is not an openly homophobic world. And so therefore her just being a trans woman is nice for people. And it can just happen and exist and you don't have to call back to it. That came across very naturally. In fact, Meg Latour, when she describes that, actually comes across completely normal. It was a perfectly fine description. Having an eating disorder is not the same thing because that would impact your character quite a lot. It impacts who you are as a person quite a lot. And it is not really tied into the Bastion as a character. You get it some like- It is not whatsoever. Oh, I have like some self hatey stuff a little bit in the back of his, like in his character. And I used to be- And it's like, it's not, yeah. It, uh, it's so uncomfortable because it's not, he, she literally was just like, well, men don't have eating disorders or it's not talked about that men have eating disorders. Despite the fact so that they I'm do. I'm going to put that in. Right, it's not talked about. Maybe, like, I'm not saying that Meg Latour doesn't know anything about eating disorders. Maybe she too has had a history with it. Maybe she has a loved one that does. There's a difference between the experience and portraying the experience. So this portrayal of this experience has nothing to do with the character. It seems, it like Will is saying, it seems like we were looking at like, I don't know, a painting that was perfect kind of or something. And we were just like, ah, this needs a dollop of yellow and there's no yellow. And you're just like, and it doesn't look good at all. And I said this to Will when I realized what was happening because Gwen keeps commenting that he, he looks thinner and she's never seen him eat. And, and so I very quickly realized, ah, 
there's going and and in the the description like before the book starts there's a disclaimer a trigger warning and it said you know like eating disorders and i quickly realized it was bastion and from a personal standpoint i would love to see a story that truly grappled with the reality that men have this is a problem for men just as much as it is for women but it just was handled if not more so sometimes. yes it, it really i mean body dysmorphia and eating disorders are super common in men and so to see something that genuinely grappled with it and like engaged would have been absolutely wonderful but this ain't it like if that's what you're looking for you're not going to find it here similarly to where it has a polyamorous relationship with a character who previously states he's a one person kind of guy some people have said that this is problematic like the polyamorous relation i will just say i will say that she doesn't describe it problematically but none of the work is put in to show how this character would go from being not okay with sharing to okay with sharing. It feels like there is one romance in this book and it is relatively well fleshed out. And then there's like, oh, and then there's a hot gymnast, but I kind of want this to be polyamorous because I'm woke. So at the end they get together and you're, the, the two storylines are not equal in terms of the time and attention that is given to them. Yes. And it feels very perfunctory. And again, that's kind of problematic when you're just shoving it in and it doesn't work. At the end, when we get to the end and we end up describing the last scene, which you'll all just love so ever so much, it's incredibly apparent what Will's talking about. But yeah, no, a good way that she could have potentially incorporated this particular trait, the eating disorder, is to explain the, like, let's say, so let's just pretend in a world that he is restricting, right? And he is not eating for the express purpose of whatever it is that he's having problems with. Well, then we would have need scenes. We would have needed scenes and situations where that psychological block with his ability to address himself and like there's going to be a lot of self-hatred, but that doesn't really seem part of his character. It seems like, yes, that was his past because he reveals it to her. But just like Maria just said, there's no work put in to infuse the character with the traits that she actually wants them it's to have. It's informed traits, as Will loves to say, where the, the author is telling you this thing, but you don't feel it. You feel much more impact of him just hating the actions of his past life than you do for his self-loathing of him being bigger once upon a time. Here's the thing. Eating disorders are about your self your body dysmorphia, right? And about control. Because I was going to say control, and I would argue using Celeste, his relationship with Celeste, yes, would have been that makes sense. a much better way. But continue with what? Body image and control, right? Okay. What gives you more control and changes your body than cyborg implants? Wouldn't that have been an interesting vector to take this through? That maybe he keeps cutting himself up as an extension of this. Maybe he's constant. He has like a weird nuclear reactor on his back that's slowly going bad because it provides him energy. There are so many ways that if you're talking about body issues, a cyborg yeah. part of that is kind of important. Or you can go the route if you want to focus on like the actual eating disorder to do uh, like he has no control with Celeste and you find out she abuses him in multiple ways. So the only way for him to control his life in any aspect of his life is to like control what goes in and out of his body, which is where mm -hmm. a lot of people, especially from abusive situations, that's how they end up in that situation. And so that could have worked. But again, the nuance, the work it would have taken for any of that is just not put in. Continuing though, because we, we gotta we gotta hustle. My mom's want to eat breakfast, and my mom made homemade bread. They're like, "Oh no, Marzana's foot's gonna go bad," and he's like, "The competition's starting," and she's like, "Do you know what it is?" And he's like, "No, I have no idea." But they have to go to this location, and then you switch to Aurora, and it's a uh, and and oh. Gwen is like, we have to help them. They're our family. I, I now have this found family. This family that I've only met one of. And who I only know the names of like four. And now all cyborgs are my family. And it's not just a matter of like, we're all in a shitty situation. I want to help as much as I can. It's it, She relies on this family thing and it feels real force. Because again, if she was just like, no, this is a shitty situation. We have to help them. All you have to do is same thing could have happened. You just change the words you use it with. Mwah. Much better. Another rotten layer to the onion. They find out that the second competition is to capture a dragon. And Gwen convinces Bastion. Because uh, you find out that dragons used to be in the universe. But now they've all been relegated to this one planet that they also threw the cyborgs on. The dragon sometimes will attack. And uh, Celeste is like, I want the red dragon. Go fetch it for me. And it's a like, if you helped bring it in, like you can work as a team. That's fine. And it's really weird because it's like, 
Is it all a pass fail? Like, how do you decide who helped to get the dragon? It's really weird. What does capturing a dragon have to do with your performance? Again, she's selling this to you as a, you need to prove who's the most, the 10 most worthy acts to go. And so again, what is a, uh, capturing a dragon? At least the actor, like the obstacle course was like, we're testing your like- Agility. Agility and athletics. But anyway, so they have to capture a dragon and Aurora's like, okay, we're gonna, her, she gets her little group of people and they're going to get the dragon. They end up finding, Aurora finds the dragon first. Abrakan, who's a douche, uses Aurora. Like, Aurora finds the dragon, then he, like, gets to just follow her and swoop in. Aurora and the dragon, and I hate this moment because this dragon is so ill-used in this story. I and know! it starts with a really humane encounter where Aurora's like, hi, you know, we were just, we would like to take you somewhere cool. I'm not here to hurt you. Like, uh, I'd like to... Like, would you mind going somewhere with me? And the dragon actually seems to be intelligent enough to pick up on the fact that she is non-threatening and that potentially there could be a peaceful outcome. But instead of doing that, Miss Meglator takes that uh, takes that concept, crumbles it into a little ball, sets it on fire, and then throws it into your face. Then Abrakan comes and he's like shooting the dragon and like Rora's like trying to defend the dragon and the dragon at one point like swoops her out of the way so she doesn't get hurt and you're like oh look the dragon's trying to and i thought like is this gonna be aurora's like thing where yes. she becomes friend with dragon and like that's gonna be like the cool thing no because sleeping beauty dragon like that would have made perfect sense oh you're right god damn yes. it that's clever and also maybe like the dragon gets cyborg implants and the two of them can communicate and they, the or dragon was kind of super protective over her like yes. anyway no 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 <laughs> We're not going down that right route. Why would we? Instead, Abraham shoots the dragon. Eventually, like Gwen and Bastion come to help out, and the dragon's almost hurting Gwen. So Rora has to like stat like there's a an arrow in the dragon's like knee. And so Rora like slams into it to hurt the dragon. And at this point, the dragon's like, fuck all, y'all. I am done. Understandably. Something happens and Marzana's foot malfunctions and like electrocutes her. And then Rora's hand malfunctions, or the dragon bites it, destroys her hand, and then it like burns her up her arm. Eventually Bastion like rides the dragon into the ground. They capture the dragon. Gwen is like we helped you get this dragon. And if you want to survive, you need to not tell Celeste that we helped you at all. Otherwise, I will take, because uh, she has syringes to knock the dragon out. And she's like, otherwise, I won't give you this syringe. And how are you going to get an angry dragon back to the lady then? And so Abraham has to be like, okay, I guess I'll share this with people. Uh, so they go back. Uh, once again, Gwen and Bastion have to slaughter a bunch of the cyborg, like, or get the parts out of a bunch of the cyber cyborgs. A couple of them die this time. Not great. If that sounds like a horrific butchery to you of like, she has to go through and kill like 20 in a night or something. Um, yeah, this will not really affect Gwen that much. Nope, not even whatsoever. She just moves on right past like an army medic. It's just completely unrealistic. It's not even like, oh, it's not even pulpy unrealistic that she can accomplish what she has so far accomplished with how little knowledge it is because Meglator made the choice to specifically tell you slap you in the face with it a million times that she cannot do this. And yet she does it. It, she, it could have easily been obviated if we simply just took that part away and then she adapted quickly. After this, she ends up like hanging out with Rora. She gets Rora her new arm and then Rora immediately like starts being cold to her. And then she, with Bastion, hatches a plot that she is, we're going to, we're gonna help everyone. We're gonna get as many people out of this as possible. So we're going to fuck Abrakin though, even though he is also a cyborg. I don't care if he dies. We're going to sabotage in the next competition, which is going to be a performance on a pirate planet where the audience gets to pick who continues or not. Um, we're going to sabotage uh, some people's like act props. Uh, and Rora's like, this is a shitty plan. Oh, also they have like a really intimate moment right before Rora gets her new hand that Gwen has been secretly making for her. Like, and again, Rora did nothing to actually seduce Gwen to do this. At this point, Gwen has done this of completely of her own volition. Rora is completely useless. Completely. There's nothing during any of these scenes, there's nothing about Rora that comes across as conniving. And in fact, all of her interactions with all of the other cyborgs, she is sweet, genuine, and sincere in all of her interactions with all of her friends. And she continues to be so with Gwen. Um, so the next morning when she wakes up, she's on Gwen's bed because Gwen installed her new hand. And Gwen is sitting on the floor in a pile of blankets instead of being like, wow, I got a new hand. 
And I really like Gwen. She's like, I got my new hand. I've done what I need to. Time to finally focus on the competition. Fuck Gwen. And she leaves. And you're like, it doesn't make any sense. You were so happy to see her. And you literally angered the dragon you were befriending to help save her life. Literally two days ago. Like, what are we doing this makes no sense. And again, it's because, and I mentioned this before, it's like Meglator was writing character motivations and she said, Rora wants to get patronage from the emperor. We'll do anything to get that done. Bastion wants to forget who he once was and also wants to be part of uh, upper management. Gwen doesn't want to die. And then cyborgs, cyborgs are her family. Like that, those are their motivations. So even at points when the story where like, cause they're very, you very quickly find out that Bastion kind of hates Celeste and he actually isn't okay with anything that's happening, but he's still like upper management is what I've always wanted to be. And I'm like, what? And then he very quickly, like he changes where he's like, okay, I'll help you help the cyborgs very quickly. So the motivation just feels flimsy. And then again, Aurora's motivation just like comes back where she's like everything for patronage. I must forsake. Gwen, even though I could have probably gotten Gwen and patronage. This is where we find out how into the patronage idea she is, which is that she was a gymnast, but she wasn't like that great a gymnast. And she broke her arm so she could no longer be a gymnast. So she was like, you know what? This apparently is really important to me. So she cut off her arm with a knife so that she could get a cyborg implant so she could become a gymnast again. In an illegal cyborg circus that would never give her patronage. Like she, she would never get patronage. This is not a good plan, but this is what is just kind of revealed casually. Her goal of patronage and joining the circus only works if you know that the emperor will eventually potentially let them perform there. If the plot reveal in this book happens. Because otherwise there's no reason that you as a person in this world, in this society where cyborgs have been outlawed and discriminated against, have been illegal for over 15 years would think, ah, if I became a cyborg, I could get eventually patronage that way. Just a simple solution for Rora in and of herself, not having to do with the plot. Go get a cyborg bone arm or whatever but have it seem like normal skin on the outside is there not any futuristic surgery like we're in the future you're telling me a broken arm this is cyberpunk they don't have the ability to make things not look like cogs and wheels and copper the steampunk aspect does nothing they're hatching a plot and they get akio marzana rora and then bastion and gwen are like we're gonna do this thing but rora's like man fucking with the other performers props means that I wouldn't be winning fair and square and that doesn't seem very right. I don't like this idea. Even though she wants a brand new arm which therefore technically puts her ahead of the game of everyone else. But not just that. You literally cut your own arm <laughs> off to join oh, no. this circus. You were like I'm not going to be friends with this girl who I really like anymore because I finally got what I needed from her and now you're squabbling about whether your tr trial to patronage is earned or not. Like so it's really weird. She ends up going to her room and she was like complaining to Akio about this as they were going to, or Marzana. One of, oh no, Marzana at this point is Sleeping Beauty part one. Marzana has not woken up since her foot short circuited and she's basically like sleeping. Nothing's like wrong with her. The, the medics have looked at her. There's nothing wrong with her, but she's not waking up and they're afraid she's going to die because she hasn't woken up. So that's Marzana. So Akio and like uh, Rora are talking on the way to her room about like, no, nah, you know, I don't really think this is a good idea. You know, uh, I don't like Abrakan, but I don't want to do that. And then she goes into her room and Abrakan is in her room with like some other people. And he's like, what were you just saying? Uh, let me hear everything. No, no, no. It's so much dumber. She's in her room and she's talking to herself. herself. Yes, and right. Abraham he overhears it. Again, there's so many forced parts of this book that are just inorganic. Who talks to themselves like that in the middle of the room and then just so happens to have the other bad guy character that needs to hear that stuff go to her? There's nothing to justify in any of the scenes so far that Abraham would be in her room just waiting. Anyway, so he tortures her and he threatens to break her new hand if she won't tell him what's happening. So instead of being like, oh shit, this would probably cause problems. She's like, no, my hand, I need to get patronage. And so she tells him like, uh, you know, there was this plan we were gonna fuck with your props in the third act. And then he like uses an electrify taser thing and uh, Rora's down. The next morning, Akio goes to find Rora. She's passed out on her bed. She's not moving. Uh, everyone comes, they realize that the same thing happened to Marzana is happening to her and they're like, what's happening? And then they find a little note from Abraham. 
<laughs> That's like your little bird told us everything uh, sucks to <laughs> suck. I know. I actually really liked his character, honestly. He was kind of funny. Gwen's like, oh no, what happened? And Bastion's like, she's betrayed us. She cut off her own arm to get like, she's ruthless. If she'd cut off her own arm to get into this circus, there's nothing she wouldn't do. And I'm like, but again, even from his point of view, how would her betraying them further her cause? Like it just, none of this makes sense. It's so convoluted and like- it is such a plot device it's because of course this is what halts the romance between rora and gwen so because gwen's like oh you've betrayed you're you know you left me with your arm all this stuff they're like we have to figure out how to save rora and marzana and then she's like i I don't like rora anymore but i still don't want her to die so i'm going to look into saving her she ends up discovering that there's something wrong with their chips earlier uh celeste wants to check on her chip and when she takes it out gwen cannot remember who she is why she's there she, she knows nothing all she feels is an a compulsion to get back to the circus to be at the circus so you're immediately like that probably isn't right i feel like celeste is fucking around with some things i forgot how but she ends up realizing that like the chips something's wrong with them so she gets a little machine that she can put the chips in and she can read the code and she realizes wow somebody has put a bunch of extra code in here and if you like she ends up just restarting the chip and both of the ladies wake up Yay! Wasn't that a satisfying callback to the Sleeping Beauty story? It really adds a lot of thematic weight. Yeah, especially since there was two of them. It's so random. It's not even like the dragon, well, like we were saying earlier, gets defensive of Roar while she's sleeping, and then it's like, ah, that's like a little bit close. No, it, she's just asleep for part of it. Yeah. I, I cannot overstate how irritating it is that the author thinks that this is like cute like it bothers me so much that the author thinks she's hot shit so it's at this point when rora wakes up and she like saves her but then like she confronts rora and she's like you lied to me and you used me this whole time and rora's like i i know but i actually do like you and she's like no i'm done and then she decides despite the fact that you know the cyborgs are now her family and she needs to help them and help she decides she's leaving fuck the cyborgs she's going out on her own she's gonna try find a a ship at the docks to take her off and uh like the first two ships don't fuck with her and then she gets to the last ship but it is a flesh trader ship because you couldn't just say slave trader she hears people like screaming below and like the entire time she's like where have the like previous uh performers gone so you find out that once they're Parts are removed. They're sold to flesh traders. And the guys on this ship, she's like, I'd like to talk to your captain. And they're like, maybe we'll just take you for ourselves, see? She ends up getting to a scuffle scuffle with them. And like, they, they're they like trying to like drag her onto the ship. And then she was like, uh, then the captain comes out and the captain's a woman. And she was like, how dare you? You would do this to other women. You're the problem <laughs> with society. Um, I know. And then Bastion realizes <laughs> she's missing and like bursts in to help her. But then like, I don't know, Bastion ends up getting like shot they end up fighting their way out of this situation she has to drag bastion to a healer at this point she now really likes bastion from this point forward the faint flutterings we got during the kiss and library scene have have begun to manifest bastion's like no you are the one who told me we need to fight and help them you leaving does nothing like you, you you're on this path stay the course and so they're like okay so they finally return to the ship to go to this pirate planet where they're going to do the third performance and during that trip Bastion tells her about his harrowed past. What it was is that his family was very wealthy and like kind of ruled this one world. And uh, they were <laughs> What are you smugglers. laughing about? I just remembering how stupid it's this It's so movie stupid. Was. I know. It's really, really lame. <laughs> they were- he seems like such a lame character after. Like he had potential and then it just was like- Well, and then the way she reacts to it. Yeah, but we I get there. Oh. The entire time he has mentioned that he has way more memories than he'd like and he'd like them to go away. And she's like, why? And he's like- I I have a past I'd like to forget. I was not a good man, Gwendolyn. I, I would like to be a better one and I can't be that until I forget everything because that's how you improve yourself. And you find out his family was like this big time smuggling like dynasty and he never wanted, like he did his own things. He never wanted to be part of that, but he was also really, really big and finds out he's dying because he he's very overweight and he's having health problems that like heart troubles that ran in his family but due to his excessive weight were even worse so he was dying and his father wouldn't because he wouldn't help with anything wouldn't give him any money to have the surgery and so his father's like i'll do it if you do this job for me and it was like to ship weapons and she was like you are a smuggler oh no you provided weapons to bad people (laughs) oh my 15 years over 20 years ago <laughs> and my my fragile heart can't take my trust is broken. <laughs> i see you differently now <laughs> Which, even though he's been 
like I was a bad man and I've been trying for the past 15 years to make myself better and forget. And like, I have not done any of those things for the past 15 years. It's smuggling. That's such a lame, and, lame and she literally was like, I'm done. And she like fucks off and he's like, Gwen, I need to talk. And she keeps trying to, he keeps trying to talk to her and then uh, she won't. But anyway, they get to the pirate planet. They're having competition three and she's like, okay. Our plan was uh, revealed, but I'm still going to try it anyway, but during a different part of the show. No one would be expect- expecting that. I mean, look, a simple re- rework of Bastion's character, his family were flesh traders. Yeah, if they were actually flesh traders. When he became useless to his family, he was sold. He became part of the system. Celeste rescued him, therefore he felt like he like, owed you know, her. He, oh, man. And then he has no control. That's so much more interesting. Yes. That's and it would be so far more interesting. And it also gives him an in. It's because that means potentially he could have been assaulted, any uh, deluge of physical atrocities. And by going through that, he would have learned. And then it, maybe he wants to forget the horribleness of those things. And that's what he wants to forget. But then he comes to the realization, oh, if I don't remember these things, I won't remember how important it is that I changed my way. And that would have been a whole character arc. Character growth! Instead of just suddenly being more solid towards the end of the book, being a marker of how he's changed. So she's like, I'm going to fuck with the props. And while she's doing it, Celeste appears and is like, ha ha ha, Abraham told me of this plot. I didn't know you, how involved you were. I will break your legs now. And she's going to like beat the shit out of Gwen. Um, and she does break one of her legs, like one of her like masked guard people. Um, and then Bastion comes in and is like, God damn it, Gwen, fucking hell. And he's like, I'll return to being your, cause like he's the ringleader. And by being the ringleader, he was no longer under Celeste and part of Celeste's part of the circus. And he was like, I'll go back to being your man. If you leave Gwen uh, alone and just leave it at this and we'll go from there. And she was like, that's a perfectly acceptable arrangement. Okay, you're my man again. Gwen, now you only have one broken leg. Akio, Marzana, and Rora end up, and Abraham end up making it to the next round. The the pirates, like, if they don't like your performance, they, like, shoot you as well. So not only are, like, people dying during the competition, <laughs> but if you also didn't get voted on, like, you also <laughs> get your shit taken out. And the entire time, like, at one point, Gwen's like, I wonder what she's doing with all of these cyborg parks since we can't make any more new cyborgs and she's literally taking the circus down to, like, 10 acts. What's up with that? And I'm like, <sighs> anyway. So they're like, now it's time to go to, uh, and also, you get a throwaway line where she's like, it's been months. Like, it's been a couple of months that we've known each other. And I'm like, has it? <laughs> it feels like maybe three weeks. Besides like the like flirtation bits in between things and like the actual competition stuff, nothing happens in the in-between time. And you're not like, it's not there like, you know, Gwen was bored out of her mind for the three weeks and bit like th- there's none of that. So like when s- characters talk about it as if they've known each other for a while, it feels really out of nowhere. You know what? One thing I was really missing in particular, um, you notated it earlier, one of the two of you did. When Gwen woke up, she we didn't even get her perspective of when she woke up. We jumped to Roar's perspective and we didn't get any backlash of the surgery or anything. I actually, back before I thought this would be a, a good book, I was expecting a whole scene of her being like in a healing area and her like recuperating from that and realigning her philosophy on life and stuff and, and the way her brain works because there's a chip in it now yeah and she's like one of the only cyborgs that have a brain insert because she had a tumor in her brain um like as in like a full-on unit. oh let's not even get into how fascinating it is to have a cyborg brain so like maybe you can just offload certain functions to it like i need to know this or certain thoughts are faster or to have that chimeric that's mind that's one of my favorite that's one of my favorite explorations which is why i loved tony stark fan fiction <laughs> Like Will said from the beginning, this is not an actual exploration of cyborgs. The cyborg functionality in this story is perfunctory. It's just, it's here to be window dressing um, and, you know, for cyborgs to be something that is not okay. Anyway, so they get to the planet where the Emperor is and the Emperor welcomes them in and they have a ball that night. And at this point, everyone is not talking to Rora, including Marzana and Akio. But now... 
Gwen is no longer talking to Bastion <laughs> because they're at odds. And she also realizes, because eventually she realizes, like, on the trip over to the other, like, the new planet, she's like, man, I fucked up. I miss Bastion. He's actually kind of a good guy. Why did I do this? And she tries talking to him, and he acts as if he has no idea, like, that they had a relationship, that there was anything going on between them, anything. Surprise! Brained wide. And she was like... <laughs> uh what's happening so like she ends up realizing uh that like stuff is weird and at the ball she like no one like really wants to help or do anything at this point and she's like there's only one person to turn to rora would help me again why given that rora doesn't like thinks she's gonna get patronage but she goes to rora and she's like something's wrong with bastion i need you to help me figure it out i need you to because like akil's like you know Bastion's just returned to his normal ways. He was he was good and chill for two months, but I think that was the blip, and, and he's not a good person, so we're not going to help you save him. But Rora, who has no relationship with Bastion at all, is like, yeah, I'll help you. And uh, so they end up, like, leaving the party, going to, like, they follow, because Bastion and Celeste left, and they, like, track where they went, and they end up at the barn where all the magical and cyborg animals are. And they, like... Rora climbs onto the ceiling. Gwen has to distract this teenager. It's a terrible scene. <laughs> she like tries to be like cyborg body. Like it's just anyway. She makes fun of him for having a like a boner and thinking that cyborgs yes. are attractive. Yeah. It's like yeah. it's again, it's really odd, and you feel like a space alien wrote it. So Rora's like, Gwen, you have to see this. Come now. And she's like, I have a broken leg. How the flip am I supposed to do this? So they end up getting her up and she looks through, and Bastion is in a stall in the barn and I think he's on his knees like hands and knees yes he is and Celeste is like replacing his, like moving his chip around and then she does what like we're in a James Bond movies guys she monologues <laughs> to no one and it's funny like because in James Bond movies they monologue to Bond about their evil plan and what they were going to do when they think he's at a weak point no she is literally by herself with a like non-functioning bastion and just gives the whole plan away, which is she's been waiting for years to kill the Emperor. She's going to have, she brainwashed Bastion to do it. And she picked Bastion, Bastion specifically, even though Abraham's an archer and probably would have been able to do it because Abraham is very noticeable. And uh, Bastion is someone nobody would notice, even though he's a tall. Even though he's the ringleader. And he's wearing a pinstripe fucking suit. He's very flashy. Like, what are you doing? And so she basically tells you she's here to, uh, like, kill the Emperor and Bastion's gonna be how she does it. And like, ha 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 ha. And then she puts the like new chip back in his head and she pockets his old chip. And Gwen's like, oh, she's fucked with his chip. That's why he doesn't remember anything because he doesn't have memories. We have to keep him from stopping to kill the emperor. And then the next morning, the emperor's like, surprise, I actually brought you here because I plan to kill you. And I plan to use you and experiment on you and use your ta cyborg tinkerer to create a weapon that will kill all cyborgs instantly. <laughs> Even though that there's only like 10. <laughs> and then and then at this moment, this is where uh, Bastion's programming kicks in and he tries to kill the Emperor. But Gwen saves the Emperor by like knocking Bastion out. And then Celeste just walks in. Her plan has failed. This woman's plan has failed. Bastion was supposed to kill the Emperor. It hasn't worked. And she just walks in and she's like, hello, Emperor, remember me? And he's like, no, I have no idea who you are. And she's like, perhaps <laughs> if I use the name Emmeline. And what you find out is there was a family who created the cyborgs and created cyborg implants and the surgery and all of the programming stuff to do it, but they were killed in a fire. Well, Celeste was actually Emmeline, the wife of this cyborg making couple who had children. The emperor was actually the one who set fire to her house and she managed to survive, but her kids died. And she listened, literally listened to the love of her life and her children burn to death because of her making cyborgs. And so she then decides to create a cyborg circus. She doesn't make more cyborg parts, even though she's the one who designed them and knows how to do it. That makes no sense to me. Yeah, it doesn't. She just uses all old cyborg parts, gets a cyborg circus for some reason in the hopes that like, like this is the part that really doesn't make sense because her plan <laughs> is eventually she's going to use these cyborgs to create an army to attack the emperor and kill him. But she creates a circus because what she's been doing with all of those cyborg parts she's been harvesting from the ax that don't work is she's been using them to upgrade her guards so her guards are like 60 to 80 percent machine now and they're and some of them are also former performers at this point why wouldn't she just create new ones you're literally the person who designed them i don't understand it which 
which is why in the circus, like, you just were like, ah, I can't make cyborgs anymore, anymore and my family's dead. Guess I'll start a circus. Like, it's not like they're limited by, like, an unobtainium resource, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, oh, no, like, to interface with the body, you need a specific metal or something like that. Like, how much cooler would it have been, Maria, your pirate ship idea of, like, maybe they're, she's owning an army? Yes. Or that's how they... they they They're capture gonna steal. some of the unobtainium. Yes. That's the whole plan is she needs a big enough crew to go steal a whole bunch so she can create the army or create the crewmates or whatever. And that would and, be the conflict of the first book is just getting the stuff. Yes, and also it would have been great character growth for Emmeline, a.k.a. Celeste, is if at the beginning she was purely cutthroat, ruthless pirate leader that didn't care about her crewmates or her her people, her pirates, and she went on and then over time over she became years. to love them and it became her family. And now she wants to make sure that, like, whatever. or And maybe she ends up changing her mind at the end and she's like, no. Or that she's conflicted. Like, book one, her conflict is that she loves her new cyborg family babies that she's helped create, but she also wants to get revenge for her old family, but it'll put her new family at risk. But she at risk, yes. Well, here it's revealed then that the Emperor is also going to kill all of the cyborgs. But not just that, he specifically needed Gwendolyn Grimm because she's such a great ship's tinkerer that they can create a death ray that can kill all the cyborgs in the galaxy from far away. This book has a serious problem starting at this point where like it has to keep addressing plot holes by characters explaining things to each other because so little of it makes sense. So she keeps like asking him like, wait, why didn't you do this? And he's like, ah, because of this and that. And you're like, this is not very elegant plotting. I'm sorry, but just because you were a good ship's tinkerer doesn't mean you can engineer weapons. Those are two separate jobs guys anyway so like the the emperor ends up escaping celeste slash emmeline has now used a little remote to turn all the cyborgs except for marzana and rora and gwen into mindless zombies with which to attack the emperor and they're like oh crap we have to get to the ship we have to help things and, and eventually they decide that like their plan is going to be to get rora to release the dragon to create enough of a distraction that they can get to the ship. Gwen confronts Cel uh, Celeste slash Emmeline and is like, listen, this is your family. You, I know your old family died, but you've got to help your new one. And she's and able instantly, to, yes. in one conversation to convince this woman who, despite 15 years of bonding with these people already and, and having a single-minded focus to drop her plans and try get everyone to escape and like the dragon comes out but then the dragon's not being helpful so then Gwen I was so bored during the oh, action I, climax I, actually... I was like why will this not end can I go up to 3.0 speed on audible I will I be able to this understand is, fun fact this is the point where I went to two times speed and I even before I did that I don't have a clear image of what was happening because Gwen's just on her little choo choo Skimmer. board yeah. and choo -choo and board. <laughs> And she's going through the sky and having this so, super intense battle. It's super intense. And Bashin and everybody else comes or other people come back online. Bashin's back online. They're on the ship. And then they go into a hole. We need to save Gwen from the dragon. What even happens to the Emperor? Nothing. He stays in the city. They, they flee. Um, and basically, like, they have to escape. And I'm not going to go through it. It's really, but the point is, the dragon comes back to be absolutely abused Gwen and Rora get the dragon pissed off so it attacks things and like everyone's attacking this poor fucking dragon who was brought here against it and it's just like why did you make the dragon seem vaguely intelligent and and like able to be reasoned with if you were just gonna fucking just shaft it during this scene I for sure thought that when Rora went to get the dragon or when I thought Rora was gonna be sent to go get the dragon reason with the dragon in some way and then the dragon was gonna help them but no the dragon's just a random wild beast in this affair going around setting fire to things chaos and that's it and they end up like so they there's a bunch of things they have to do to be able to leave they end up like saving and then they decide to take the dragon with them knock it out because you know they did this to this dragon and it wasn't its fault so they're gonna you know like maybe release it at some point and they're like wow, 
we're safe now. The em we escaped the Emperor's clutches. We're all on here. And Celeste briefly tries to be like, never mind, I'm back in control, bitches. But then, like, they thwart her. And she's like, ah, oh, I guess I'm not in control anymore. And you guys are in charge. And they're like, where are we going? They have this plan to go to the planet that Bastion's family runs that he doesn't want to go to, but she's like, it's our only option. They're out of the protectorate of the emperor. And, you know, it's a good waypoint for us to figure out what we're going to do. And he's like, oh, fine, I guess. And she's like, don't worry, I'll be there with you every step of the way, baby. The story's wrapping up, but like during the healing process, Gwen wakes up, she's in a bed. Bastion's there sitting next to her like, how are you, baby? Roar is there to check on how she's doing. And Aurora's like, I just want you to know that I, I really didn't mean to give our plot away and I really do care about you and I know that that ship has sailed and I can see that you genuinely love Bastion and that he's good for you. No, no, not just that though. No, no, no. It's worse than that because I remember I've replayed this scene because I couldn't believe that she did this. <laughs> Rora and Bastion are standing there um, or whatever. Gwen is in the bed and Gwen is talking to Rora and says all that Maria just said and then she's just like, I really, I love you. I love you, Gwen. She does not say anything more. Bastion ends up going to Gwen and they heavy pet each other and make while Rora, while Rora is just standing silently there at the door. And finally, after heavy petting, she's like, maybe I should leave. And I'm like, oh my God, poor, I don't even care about Rora, but poor Rora, Jesus Christ. Because like Bastion and Gwen have their reconciliation scene because again, they haven't reconciled from the previous fight yet. Um, so they reconcile and she's like, I love you. I love you. And then they do what Katie just described, which is like, um, nom, nom, make out scene. <laughs> and then Gwen, uh, Rora's like, I guess I'm just going to leave guys. And Gwen stops and she's like, no, Rora, I also love you. And I'd like to be with both of you. I need both of you in my life. And I can't imagine not being with either of you. And I hope that's okay. And like, Rora's like, yeah, that's absolutely fucking okay. And Bastion's like, who again has described himself before as like, possessive he likes his one person he's like yes that is amenable provided that you know our bed is mainly just the two of us when we're in it sometimes you know rora can be present but i'd prefer it for the most of the time it's just the two of us when we're there but i i agree to share you and then rora's like for the record i will be in your two's bed whenever you'd like yeah it was really horny rora's never described as being into bastion thinking she doesn't even think like wow he's attractive if only he wasn't such a prey they have like never interacted in the book they've interacted like three times or Maybe. like had a conversation we've been in rora's point of view she never thinks about bastion like man he's so uptight but she I'd gets vaguely jealous of him when she realizes rora and ba or gwen and bastion are developing a thing but that's it so so this comes out of fucking nowhere. And then, you know what else comes out of fucking nowhere? Big Dick Daddy Bastion. Yeah, because uh, at this point, he's slinging. At this point, she says, and I quote, I want to fuck both of you right fucking now. Oh my, just like that. Just like that same intonation. Maria kept sending me tweet like messages of exactly quoting it. And it's hilarious. It's so bad because she's like, and they're like, are you okay? You're kind of injured. And she's like, no, it has to be right now. And then Rora goes to like, they have to go lock the door, do stuff. And she's like, good, go do that. But don't come back till you're naked. And then she's like, you, Bastion, <laughs> I want you to fuck me. And then she points at Rora, you, I want you to sit on my face. And this is how these characters who again mainly bastion and gwen have been developing a romance the first time they do anything explicitly sexual is in a threesome setting where he i think he goes down on her first i don't know like he, he fingers her all i remember is that the sex was like it literally was described as ball slapping yeah and so i was just like it's not great and how it, tasteless it, it really is not great oh i can't imagine the first time i ever have sex with anyone like like it, never mind two people it being like that it's just especially like coming off of it's not soft that's a lot of trust that they did not actually build at all and that's what i was saying them. earlier about the, like the polyamorous thing has the same problem that the eating disorder thing is it's not fleshed out like there's not a point where rora sees how bastion is good for gwen and that how they genuinely have feelings for each other and she comes to terms with their relationship but there is no point where Bastion comes to terms with Rora 
and Gwen as an item or like is kind of into them. So like him suddenly just being like, ah, oh, yes. Now in the story, it is explicit that he gives his consent and he's okay with the situation and he's kind of into this. But it's just like weird because it comes out of nowhere. It really feels like there's one romance here and then she was like, but polyamory is very woke. So I'll include that. So there's representation. What would have made so much more sense is if this book ended with Bastion and um, Gwen and then in book two- Rora and them. Yeah, Rora kind of ingratiates more with them and then they become comfortable with that. But no. One of the biggest things is, right, that Rora has not reacquired trust with Gwen. And trust and Bastion with her. Uh, w I would not have sex with a person I thought was belittling me and controlling my life. And that's what Bastion is to her, essentially. Why there's no reason either one of them, except for for their love of Gwen, but that's not enough. And that makes them less of characters and more plot devices. And that's how the book ends. They well, they have the sex and then the, like the other stuff where Celeste tries to take over, but- And they're like, we need new names. Oh, remember how this is supposed to be a storybook retelling? Okay, Rora is like Aurora and Gwen is Belle and like Bastion is- He's the name that the beast from Beauty and the Beast actually has, like his, his <sighs> name. Um, like, but, but whatever. Yeah, it's, it's not great. But anyway, that's, and they're like forward to our new life goals and going to Bastion's old planet. And that's where it ends. And it, like, this is a ride and a half. It just, it doesn't work. The, and I forgot to mention this earlier. The narration curses a lot and it shifts tones all the time. So you'll be in the middle of a scene that should be serious. And then like a like you'll get slapped in the face with like her heart felt as heavy as a large woman's tits or the character will be like god damn she's hot and like in the middle of like an unrelated scene and like there's a lot of fuck and like cursing and I don't mind narration especially like and if this was from first person it would work a little bit more but it's third person that feels like it's trying to be first person and it's very weird. Also between Rora and Gwen's perspectives just like what Maria's saying the cursing actually muddies their ability like uh meg's ability to differentiate yeah between the two of them so for example the one that i mentioned earlier she needed to figure out how to keep gwen wrapped around her finger as well as her pussy like <laughs> that it originally when we got gwen's perspective i know i know it really like i told my boyfriend that and he choked on the beer he was drinking also why why say well, I, there's so many other ways than pussy also um that's more of gwen's narrative if we're gonna keep with that narrative voice mm -hmm. yes thank you um rora in all ways that she is supposed to be depicted is not supposed to really be like that. So it's very weird that she speaks exactly like when. It's a horny, badly paced. Badly plot out. The one thing I will say about it is that it does move quickly and it's much shorter than the savior's sister or or the first book. It's, it's shorter by a fair amount. But if you uh, wanna watch more of us, subscribe. We do have a Patreon and um, bye. Bye. bye.